guys so much for joining us today. I'm Stephanie Dua. I'm the president and co-founder of Homer, the essential early learning program for kids ages two to eight. And I'm so excited today to bring to you a discussion, a really timely discussion. Next month is um, Mental Health Awareness Month with Dr. Harold Koplowitz. He is the founder and president and chief medical officer of a really important institution, the Child Mind Institute. The Child Mind Institute um, and Dr. Koplowitz has served over 2 million children um, through their work of their nonprofit, but also then directly helping tens of thousands of children. Um, and why we're here today is because I, um, as a parent, um, a mom of three kids, always found um, finding credible parenting advice is super overwhelming. And it's the number one complaint we hear from parents, like, where do I go for great advice? Um, and it's probably not Dr. Google, as Dr. Koplowitz has talked about, and he'll talk about a little bit. You know, we want to make things simpler for our audience and our viewers, and we're just grateful that you're joining us today with Dr. Koplowitz. We're going to talk about his new book. It's really an important book. I would encourage you to get it, read it, reread it, put it on Audible while you're jogging, while you're cooking, listen to it again and again, because there's such great content in there. Um, so, before we get started, Dr. Koplowitz, I just wanted to ask you, what made you decide to write The Scaffolding Effect? So I have to give you full transparency. Some people love to write books um, and some people find it a chore. I find it a chore. It's not something that happens easily. I, I love to teach, I like to talk, but writing really makes me self-conscious. And so I wrote a book in 1996 called It's Nobody's Fault. Uh, new Hope and Help for Difficult Children and Their Families. And then I wrote a second book called More Than Moody, Understanding and Treating Adolescent Depression. And over the past decade at the Child Mind Institute, it's become very clear to us that parents come to us and say, I worry about my child. Is my child gonna be able to be independent? Will my child be able to fend for themselves when I'm not here? And there's always the question, am I doing too much or am I doing too little? And that theme, crosses all socioeconomic groups. That theme crosses all racial and ethnic groups. And so it became clear that there was a need for us to talk about a different style of parenting. And I think what's happened over the last few decades is that we have shifted from a more laissez-faire type of parenting, which was more my parents or maybe your parents' mm -hmm. attitude, which was you sheltered your kid, you clothed them, you fed them, and you kind of, you, you didn't necessarily play with them. And we've gone to the other extreme now where we do a lot of things for our kids. And sometimes out of love, we are sending a message to them that they can't be independent, that they can't master these things on their own. So the idea of the scaffold effect is that you can raise resilience, self-reliance, secure kids, even in an age of anxiety, but you have to think about it. You have to recognize that you as the parent is the scaffold, that you produce uh, the structure, the support, the encouragement for the building, which is your child. And you don't control how the building's gonna come out. That building might be mid-century, it might be a split level, it might be a skyscraper. And even though you don't like it, you don't get to live in it. Your kid gets to live in it. And it's really important to recognize that there are planks. We need to have patience and warmth. And we also have to have dispassion and simultaneously monitoring. And those are things that if we don't do those things for our kids, uh, the scaffold gets shaky. And if the scaffold is shaky, well, quite clearly, uh, the building is gonna be shaky too. Now, and I wrote this, frankly, way before, I finished it before the pandemic. I actually mm. did the audible during the pandemic, which by the way, uh, it really sounded exciting when someone said, oh, we want your voice on the audible. <laughs> and then you go to the, you go to the studio and you're separated in your studio, the director's in another cubicle and the recorder, and they, you know, it takes days because you should raise your voice, lower your voice, you <laughs> missed that you said she, you mean her. Um, but I have to tell you, reading the book out loud was very different than writing it. And you start to recognize that even someone who should know better uh, has made a lot of mistakes. And the important message I think from the scaffold effect is no matter how old your child is, there is time to change the blueprint. For you as a parent to be less uh, controlling, less helicoptering, less concierge, less snowplow, and really step back and give your kid that encouragement, that structure, that support, that's going to make them feel independent. 
I love that. And I have three teenagers and it's, and I was like, where were you when my kids were babies? Because I, um, and many of our audience doesn't know this, but one of the, the, my first mom friend is a woman named um, Julia Burns. And we had our two first babies together and we met on the Upper West Side in a Starbucks and we ran into each other and her baby, Theodora was sleeping beautifully and soundly and my baby was screaming her head off. Um, and Julia um, is, is one of the um, partners um, in the Child Mind Institute. So it's great. It's great that so much time has passed and now you're here in our lives um, for our teenagers even. Help us think a little bit about um, when you have young children, you know, sort of this age is zero to eight, what does that scaffold need to look like very practically? Well, let's just think about morning routines. For, for most of us, in America now, we have multiple jobs. I mean, during COVID, we're, we have three jobs, right? Because not only we're a parent and, um, and a worker, a doctor, a writer, whatever, uh, but we're also now a tutor and a playmate. And, uh, and all of a sudden, we're doing a lot more housework and cooking than we ever did before because you can't escape. Earlier in the pandemic, we couldn't even escape to go get food. Um, so I think we try to be as efficient as possible. So if you have a five-year-old, the most efficient thing to do is go into their room, pull off their pajama tops, pull down their pajamas, help him put on his underwear uh, and his t-shirt and his sweatpants or whatever it is, his socks and fix the, fix the seam so it doesn't, so he doesn't get upset and, you know, and we're done for the day, right? On. But if we do it with a scaffold effect, we give him structure and support. We help him pull out his clothes the night before that he wants to wear, you know, and maybe the color assortment isn't what you would like, or maybe it's a t-shirt when it's cold outside, but he's not going outside. So we let it go. We, we let him have that control. And then the next morning, we tell him to go on and take his pajamas off, put them in the hamper and put on his clothes. Now it's going to take longer there's a very good chance he's gonna get lost in his room. That, you know, you, you come upstairs and he doesn't have the socks on or he just has the t-shirt on and he forgot to take his pajamas pants. But if we do this with support and encouragement and structure, it won't take very long for him to be able to take his pajamas off and put his clothes on. And that mm -hmm. will make it easier for you as a parent, even though there was more time in the beginning to help him be independent. Mm -hmm. And the t-shirt might be on backwards, but we can make, a, you know, we can make adjustments, but the messaging is you are capable, you mm -hmm. are competent, mm -hmm. I know you can do this. And also the praise part of that is, I'm so impressed that you put your pajamas away. I'm so impressed and happy that you were able to get dressed. And so you are basically encouraging effort because mm -hmm. even if it doesn't turn out, even if the pants, the sweatpants are on the wrong way, or even if he put on his shoes without his socks, it is the effort that we are encouraging. And that's the scaffold. So because it's not the end product, it's not the A or coming in first in the race or memorizing the music for the recital. It's the effort that we mm -hmm. are focused on because at the end of the day, people who put in effort, those are the most resilient self-reliant and secure people because failure is always an option, right? We yeah. don't always have success. And in fact, our failures, if we handle them correctly, are actually learning experiences, make us stronger, make us mm -hmm. better for the next race or for, so I think that's the, if one keeps thinking about it and it clearly is different developmentally, sure. treat a teenager differently, but the, the scaffold for a teenager is to say to a 16 year old, I don't want you to drink. The reason why I think alcohol is problematic is it's illegal. You will, your judgment will be impaired. You might get physically sick and you go through all the reasons why you don't think, and you have a conversation about it. And it's not one conversation and it's not a lecture. It's actually a give and take. But when the time comes and you say, but if by some chance you get drunk, please call me. Do not get behind the wheel of a car. Do not go into a car with someone who's drunk. I really want you to call me. And so when they do call you, and say, dad, I'm drunk, or I can't get home because Josh is drunk. You go there, you, you are present, you are really recognizing, I am that scaffold for you, and mm -hmm. you don't yell at them. You right. don't say, I'm so disappointed, I can't right. believe you did this. How many times did we have the conversation? You bring them home, and the next day you do have a conversation about drinking. 
but not that kind of, you know, not that negative critical stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, the easiest way to think about it is uh, nonsense criticism, which I, I have to tell you, dispassion is one of the planks. And so your kid is not putting the napkin on their lap mm -hmm. um, and they're chewing with their mouth full, uh, yeah. with their mouth open. And, you know, and they're 30 years old. <laughs> <laughs> We're eating so many meals together. I have some of those, yes. Right, you know, because of COVID, we were eating meals mm -hmm. together. And I thought to myself, I got to be out of my mind to start criticizing their manners. I mean, uh, hopefully they're not doing this in front of strangers, but this is my problem, not their problem right now. Right. Because they're grownups. And if I really want to have a conversation with them, I better find three positive things to say to them three labeled praises for something significant before I say something critical that I think might be constructive. So thank you for sharing that funny story that really, I'm really, I, I, it was terrific. And, or thank you for setting the table uh, or thanks for cleaning up. I mean, really catching your child being good. I mean, mm -hmm. just think about that because we're gonna talk about labeling next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so easy to negatively track to find all the wrong things about your kids and then to label that child lazy or spoiled. Mm -hmm. I, if I hear one more parent say, oh, my child is spoiled. No, cheese spoils, fish spoils, meat spoils. Children don't spoil. They might not be as independent. They might be too entitled at times, but all of that mm -hmm. can change. They're not, mm -hmm. they're not done. We're not, you know, we don't throw out, we throw out spoiled food. Mm -hmm. Don't do that to our kids. And so the fact that inevitably our, we start negatively tracking and labeling, we say, oh, this child is lazy and this child is, has initiative or this child's my good child and this child's my bad child. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's just terrible because the bad child feels their self-esteem is awful and the good child's just waiting to disappoint their parent. So right. you've made them more anxious. And the other thing we do once we label is we do confirmation bias. It's the mm -hmm. same reason that we watch CNN or we watch Fox or we watch MSB, uh, MSNBC to confirm that our beliefs are correct. Mm -hmm. Well, we constantly are looking to confirm that that's the lazy child or that's, mm -hmm. the, or that's the bad child. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. frankly, we can break that very easily. You just have to do it for two weeks. Try catching your child being good. Monitor mm -hmm. good behavior and catch it and label it and praise it. The first thing that's going to happen, your kid's going to think some someone a body snatcher took mom. And <laughs> after they get, then they will say, you know, I'm going to give you more good behavior. They're not going to say it out loud. Right, right. Everyone likes to be praised. Your kids want to do well in school. Your kids want you to say yeah. nice things about them. But you you have to catch them being good and not pay attention to insignificant mm. off task behavior. So we're going to turn to this concept of labeling and praise, which I think is really important. I can just share a very brief story for myself to that underscores um, this point. When I was young, I was teased by in my family as being the airhead. I mean, this is dating me, right? Now. This is the 80s. Um, but you know, I grew up with the sense that I was the airhead. So that meant I was going to say something really stupid at some point and people were going to laugh at me. And then I felt really anxious about saying anything. And I felt that I had to do prep and I had to think about what I was going to say before. And the moment I would say something, I would brace myself for people laughing at me and my family, you know, and they obviously did it in good jest. They didn't mean it in ill intention. But then for the rest of my life, I really spent a long time not being very confident, not being very confident in my ability to carry on a conversation or say something really smart. I'm not trying to create fear in every parent, but I think there's, what is so powerful about your model is that we can change that dynamic. You know, we, with very simple tools, we can change the dynamic. And so let's talk about labeling. I want to hear your sense about the active use of the label in a conversation with a parent. And also sometimes it's a belief of the parent, but they're not saying it, right? So they believe they have a star child, use that example, a star child and the troublemaker, right? Or the responsible independent one and the scattered, you know, you know, distracted one. So they we we compare our children against each other and categorize them in some way. Um, so let's talk about why do we do that and how do we stop doing that, frankly? What are what are the long-term consequences of that? So if you're listening to this conversation and you have a family that does a lot of teasing, I think that the best thing you could get out of this conversation, even without buying the scaffold effect, is stop teasing your children. 
it doesn't work. It's toxic. Your kids may look like they're enjoying it, but it's a put down. Kids mm -hmm. don't do well with their parents teasing them. They need their parents to be very straight and not make them, because it's a caricature. Because when you tease someone, you're basically poking at their weakness. That's what you're teasing them or their insecurity. Oh, there goes Josh looking in the mirror or there goes Adam, you know, breaking something or there goes Sam, you know, being so dizzy that he forgot his books, you know, at, at, at school. And I think it's really important that we look at our children's characteristics, their assets, their deficits. And as great parents, we wanna make their assets better. Mm -hmm. We wanna give them a chance to play baseball if they're really athletic, or we wanna give them tennis lessons if they seem to have a real interest in it. And we get them a tutor in math if they have a mm -hmm. weakness in math. Mm -hmm. But if we, and even if it's done in deep affection, it doesn't work. Adults can tease each other, but having an adult tease a child and particularly your own child, the power dynamic just doesn't work. Your kid can't tease you back. It's, mm -hmm. it's not appropriate. You'll get angry. You'll tell him, you'll think he's disrespectful. So one rule, stop teasing. But the other piece is we naturally categorize everything in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, we, good restaurants, bad restaurants, good neighborhoods, bad rest, bad neighborhoods, good schools. And so inevitably we do that to our kids and if you want to do that, because it's a knee jerk response, you have to keep that to yourself mm -hmm. because very often you are wrong. You know, mm -hmm. uh, in my home, uh, my oldest son was always socially reticent, but an exceptional student, you know, just mm -hmm. he was intellectual from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. My middle son was always very athletic, but had a very severe learning disability. Mm -hmm. And my third son was just happy go lucky. And we just took it for granted that our third son wasn't a student. He just didn't seem to put the effort in. Mm -hmm. He always liked going to school. He always had a lot of friends. And if you would have asked me, I would have written him off as far as, you know, a really competitive high school student. Mm -hmm. and, and it wasn't that important. In other words, we thought mm -hmm. this is what we got, you know, DNA roulette, one given a learning disability, <laughs> and very athletic. And, yeah. but, you know, it turns out my third son was incredibly intellectually curious. And if, if you got him curious, he really pursued it. He, mm. he did a deep dive and he, he turned into an extraordinary student as a high school student and actually a college student. And after he finished college, he went and became a Fulbright scholar. And wow. that would have been the last thing we would have thought. I mean, he studied the effects of sanctions against money laundering in Croatia wow. because they wanted to join the EU. Uh, and then he surprised us again. He said, oh, I'm, I, I'll apply, I'm getting into, I'll go into law school, but I'm going to take a year off. He became a yoga instructor. Right. I mean, trust me, not hard to scaffold that one, yeah. but then he went to Harvard Law School. So the idea is that we didn't build the building, you know, right. we helped the building grow up. But if we would have let our pre predestined impressions mm -hmm. um, Sam could easily have just become a yoga instructor. Is that good or bad? I don't know. But we wouldn't have let him or we wouldn't have encouraged, you know, all that intellectual curiosity because right. we, we were doing that for everyone at the dining room table. We were doing right. that by going to lots of museums because we like going to museums. And we just weren't convinced that he it was sticking with him, but it was okay. So I think preconceived ideas are really very problematic because mm -hmm. your kid is not going to grow into the building that he potentially could have, you know what I mean? That, yeah. That's the important part. Yeah. That's, the, that's the problem. That, that's actually the problem with, um, with labeling and mm -hmm. with not praising. Praise is reinforcement. You can yeah. change this blueprint whenever you want to. So if your kid is four or five, great. We really have got a lot of time. But if your kid is 16, it is still time right. to change the blueprint and to say, right. uh, I'm going to do this differently. I'm going to stop criticizing his clothes or his hair or the fact that he's not making his bed in the morning, I'm going to focus on catching him being good. Perfect. The fact that he's so passionate about poetry yeah. or about sports. Um, the other piece- It's a mindset about, shift, right? I mean, yeah. it's just like a reminder for ourselves that we have to focus on the positive. But I also think it's essential, it's our job to keep our scaffold on the same level as- Yeah, I, I love think that. that. If you're a contractor, you're up here, the building's down there, yeah. it's just not gonna work. But that means that if your kid's really interested in something that you're not interested in, it's your obligation to 
find out about that topic. Yeah. I am not a sports fan, never have right. been. My kids love, my oldest son loved Michael Jordan. I started following the Chicago Bulls. You know, it was work. I had to look at the sports section, <laughs> not stuff for me that, you know, um, but, but that's what you're supposed to do. Yeah. If you want to be able to have a conversation with them, if you mm. want to catch them being good, if you want them to feel like you understand them, that means that they don't have to get interested in what you're interested in. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure that you're interested. And that's also what's going to give them passion because you right. are reinforcing their interests. Last piece I want to hit on is parent self-care. I think it's something that in particular moms, we have a deficit of self-care. You know, we think um, we have to look after our kids first. We have to, you know, still the household work is largely um, burdened by, by the moms. And even if they're know, working full time, even if they're working full time. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so you say to yourself, like, I'll go to the doctor later, or I'll, I want to meditate, but that'll have to come later. Or, I'll buy the, you know, like whatever that self-care looks like time alone, time downtime is something that comes at the bottom of the list and explain how self-care is child care. I loved that phrase. Um, and that's a, an important thing for everyone to hear. And more important now than ever before, mm -hmm. right? In the middle of a global pandemic, but on a daily basis, self-care is child care. You know, that metaphor, we're on the airplane, the flight attendant says, if the air compression drops and the, right. and the mask comes down, put it on yourself first before you put it on your kids. Does that really sound right? It is right. Because once you're breathing, you can then take care of your kids. And if your yeah. kid is struggling with the mask or you have more than one child, it makes perfect sense, even though it feels a little you know, I, I'm really gonna put myself before my kid. You have to sleep. There's a study that just came out that if you don't the sleep Times, seven yeah. hours, seven hours dementia. a day, you're increasing your chances of dementia in your seventies. You yeah. must sleep. That it's essential. Seven yeah. hours is the minimum. You must eat something green. You must eat something good. You must do some exercise. exercise. You, you know, you don't want to go to the gym, go take a 20 minute walk and you must do something spiritual. So if mm -hmm. you're not going to go to church or you're not going to synagogue or a mosque, then do 10 minutes, 10 minutes of mindfulness mm -hmm. every day. It, it's not great if you're walking and doing mindfulness, but that's fine. You wanna do two things at the same time, but it's for you. And the model that you give to your child is that I take care of myself so right. I can take care of you, but I want you eventually to take care of yourself also. I want you to exercise, or there's a reason why we have broccoli or we mm -hmm. have a salad. Uh, there's a reason why we need to calm down. We need to have moments of calm for us to give our brain a rest. And so I, I can't tell you more fervently and strongly that for a scaffold to work, the scaffold has to be secure. And for it yeah. to be secure, you must have self-care. You're doing it for your child as yeah. well as for yourself. And maybe that gives us permission to do it, right? Thinking about doing it for our child kind of gives us the permission, especially for those of us who feel like we're we being feel guilty. selfish. So it, yeah, it doesn't exactly. take much for exactly. most parents to feel guilty or worried about yeah. their child. And I'm telling you, you have to do this because you want your child to have that structure and support and encouragement from you. Well, I wanna say thank you so much, Dr. Kopowitz. This has been so enlightening and I would encourage everyone to purchase, read the book, The Scaffold Effect. It's brilliant and you're doing such great service to everyone, um, both directly through your nonprofit, but also in these conversations with, with folks like me, you know, I'm learning even with teenagers, I'm learning from you. So thank you, Dr. Harold Kapowitz, world-renowned psychologist and psychiatrist um, and the president and co-founder and chief medical officer of the Child Mind Institute. Thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm.